Welcome to today's webinar on achieving cyber resilience in the UK public sector. We're pleased to have two expert speakers from Zerto, a Hewlett Packard enterprise company with us today. That's Chris Rogers, senior technology evangelist and Tony Walsh, public sector business development. Just to let you know, we will be recording the session and we will share the link with attendees. There will be Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so please submit your questions via the Q&A function um, and I will interject those if relevant. Um, if not, we'll keep them to the end. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Chris Rogers and Tony. Tony, over to you. Thank you, Nikki. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining this morning. Um, my name is Tony Walsh. I am the Zerto Business Development for UK Public Sector, which includes healthcare and education. Um, I'm going to start the presentation off today and just talk a little bit, give you an introduction to Zerto and, and talk about where we've come from and some of the core uh, things that we do. Um, Chris will then pick up later on and talk more about a specific solution around cyber resilience for you. So Zerto have been around for oh, since 2011, so about 13, 14 years now, um, and a part of HPE for the past just over two years. So we've been the leader in disaster recovery, um, software only, hypervisor and cloud-based replication. So providing a, a flexible, always on protection without any storage or, or infrastructure or vendor lock-in, whether that's on-premises or in public cloud. Our focus has been on delivering recovery points of seconds. So rather than having to go back to the yesterday's copy of backup, which could be 12 to 24 hours out of date, recovery points of seconds, and as importantly, or maybe more importantly, recovery times in minutes. So to be able to quickly restore operations, a little bit like a Sky Plus box, by rewinding back to a point just before the problem happened and restarting your critical applications from that point in time. That's all wrapped up in, in a whole um, group of, of orchestration software that enables you to do um, seamless failover, failback, non-disruptive testing, which can be very important to easily recover individual files, virtual machines, or multiple VM application stacks. Next slide, Chris, please. So if you look at our, our history, where we came from, we started off as a, as a disaster recovery software company, um, really focused on providing those low recovery point and recovery times for um, things like a, a data center catching fire, data center flooding, losing power, um, or in some of our American colleagues looking at how to protect themselves from um, hurricanes affecting their data centers. So it really was more about those, um, what people term as natural disasters uh, and how to help recover from those in a really quick and efficient way. Um, over time, we moved that from, from more looking at just data centers to looking at public cloud as well. There's been a big push over the last 10 years towards public cloud. So if you see the slide there, we support AWS, Microsoft Azure, Oracle, Google, uh, all, all of the major public cloud brands, as well as supporting many um, managed service providers who use Zerto under the covers to provide their, um, their disaster recovery as a service offering. But I would say over the last um, three or four years, the conversation has turned much more around to ransomware resilience. You know, th those, those more traditional natural disasters we talked about, things that are probably not very likely to happen but if they do, you need to be prepared and be able to recover. We now pivot to ransomware, you know, and we'll see throughout some of the, the figures on, on these slides that are coming. You know, it, it's prevalent at the moment. It's uh, it, it almost seems to be not, a, you know, it's a case of when, not if, you, someone's going to get hit by ransomware. We see it in the news every week. So we have introduced some additional, as, as well as, as, our, as our ability to recover really quickly and recover to a point that seconds ago, um, as opposed to traditional backup, um, we've now introduced real-time encryption detection. So we, we, we're, we're used to that, that quick recovery. We've now introduced an ability to detect that ransomware encryption is happening in real time. A lot of the traditional backup vendors will offer that, that kind of service, but typically they're looking at the backup they took last night, doing a scan of that, and then coming to you today and saying, we, we've noticed encryption in yesterday's backup. By that time, it's probably too late because it's probably spread across the whole environment. So we're really focused on on early identification that something's happening in the environment and then being able to flag you and give you a, a point seconds ago that you can recover to and recover really quickly. 
Next slide, please, Chris. So what's different about Zerto? So I guess the first thing to say, we've talked about backup already. Zerto is not a backup recovery product. There are many, many of those out there. Um, I'm sure if I did a poll of, of the, the people on the call, there'll be numerous different backup products that people are using. And backup products are great. They, they do a good job. They're very good for long-term retention, for compliance, and um, yeah, been able to recover, I suppose, small amounts of information as and when you need them. Um, so we're not backup, we are complementary to backup. So whatever backup product you're using, we see Zerto as a complementary technology to really focus on how you can recover your, your business critical, your mission critical applications as quickly as you can to ensure your, your business continuity, to ensure your business carries on running. And what's different really, and we've talked about a bit of this already, is you know, it's, it's, it's real-time replication and detection. So we're not doing periodic backups. We're not, we're not saying, well, at this point in time, we're going to take a copy of your data and then we'll take another copy in 12 hours or in four hours. We are continuously copying every time a piece of data changes in the, in the applications and virtual machines that we protect. We're taking a copy of that data and we're storing it in what we call a journal file. Now, that journal file can be from a couple of hours up to 30 days in length. And we have uh, recovery checkpoints inserted in there every 10 seconds. So you can go back 10 seconds before the problem happened, 20 seconds before the problem happened, up to 30 days. So it's really, really granular. Again, it's a bit like the Sky Plus box. You can rewind back to any point in time and recover your critical applications. And we talk about application-centric protection. So again, typically when you when you have a, a, a standard backup schedule, most uh, critical applications are made up of multiple servers or virtual machines. Those servers or virtual machines will get backed up at different points in time throughout your standard backup window. So when you come to recover, there's a lot of manual intervention needs to go in to piece that back together and get the application running. We do that work up front. We group all the virtual machines that are part of an application into what we call an application protection group. When we recover, we recover that application protection group. So every virtual machine in that group is recovered to exactly the same second, therefore ensuring the application comes up first time every time. If we look at the operational efficiency, we have a, a whole um, suite of orchestration built into the product. So we try and make it as easy for our customers as possible. And when you want to do a recovery, all you do is you select the virtual machines or applications you want to recover. You select the time in the in the journey you want to recover to, usually the 10 seconds ago, and then you hit the recover button. Zerto does all the work in the background for you in terms of rebuilding the application to that point in time and presenting the application out to you to be able to use as a, as a user. That then leads into the bottom point there, non-disruptive testing. Not only can you do a, a live failover if you have a major problem, you can also, as often as you want, you can do a test failover of your applications. And this is pretty key because most customers we talk to when we ask the question, how often do you do a DR test? The answer is usually very quiet or the answer is once a year or not very often because it's really difficult doing a full DR test because it normally has an impact on production. With Zerto, there's no impact on production. You can do a full test of a full failure of all your applications into a test network. Production carries on running, production carries on copying data into the journal so you can do a real recovery if you need to. We talked about multi-cloud already, so Zerto is agnostic. Zerto can do um, application migration or application protection to, from, and between on-premises, private cloud, and any of the public cloud providers. And um, we can even do protection between regions within public cloud, which is becoming a, a quite a, an interesting use case now. And it's really simple. So uh, Zerto software only, it takes about a couple of hours to install and configure. Um, it's got a lot of flexible architectures, as we discussed, around public cloud uh, and, and private cloud. And there's a whole suite of analytics uh, wrapped around that. So if you have multiple deployments of Zerto, you can wrap them all up into a single uh, vision, a single view, uh, and understand uh, previous trends, forward trends, and, and manage the environment from a single place. Next slide, Chris. So when we focus on on cyber, some of the things that we're hearing from our customers uh, and from, from some of the other um, people in the marketplace. We talked about, um, about the more traditional um, natural disasters. You know, we're seeing that Zerta, that, that ransomware is, a, is the new natural disaster. If you look last year, according to um, IDC, 61% of disaster responses were triggered by ransomware. 
That's that's quite a, quite a staggering fact. So it is becoming that ransomware is becoming the thing that people are worried about, as opposed to the more traditional, I've got a problem in my data center or, or a major IT problem. And then there's the dilemma. You know, you you get hit by ransomware. What do I do? Do I pay the ransom? If I pay the ransom, will I get my data back? Will I get my applications back up and running? Uh, who knows? It's a bit of a it's a bit of a gamble, really. And then really critically is speed of recovery. The average time to recover from ransomware is one month. That's according to a report by Sophos. Um, and the reason for that is because most people are trying to recover from backups. And backups are not designed for large scale recovery. Um, so that, that's where you know you get this this challenge of I've had a I've had a ransomware attack, I'll recover from my backups. I guess the first question is, have I ever tested my backups? Do I know that I can recover from them? We'll talk about another challenge specific to ransomware and backups in, in a couple of slides. But even if you can recover from backups, the speed of recovery is pretty prohibitive. And I would suggest that you know, 20 years ago, it, that that was okay because most most things were still run manually and some some things were reliant on IT. Um, now everything relies on IT. Everything relies on those, those um, online applications. So t having those applications offline for a month or the critical ones offline for a month is not tenable in today's world. And then there's compliance. There are a number of standards around. Um, we've had GDPR for a long time. HIPAA is a healthcare standard in the US. We've got Dora that's come in now, which is around um, financial services and, and their ability to recover their applications in, in a timely manner. Now, now there are not there are no mandated standards within public sector. However, um, go on to the next slide, please, Chris. There is a, you know, there is a government cybersecurity um, plan out to twenty thirty, and there's also a very similar one for healthcare. Um, and that looks at, um, you know, it states cyber resilience is the ability of an organisation to to maintain this delivery of its key functions and protect its data despite adverse cybersecurity events. And there are five pillars to that. There's managing the risk. There's protecting against an attack. There's detecting an attack and, and, and some other security event. And there's minimizing the impact of the attack. And then across all of that goes developing the right skills and, and knowledge and culture within the organization. Now, from a Zerto perspective, uh, we, we, there, are, there are a number of software products out there that do early detection and prevention. Um, so we don't play in that space. We're really, really focused on what happens if a, a ransomware attack or other cyber attack happens. How do you detect it early? And then how do you minimize the impact of that? That, um, that ransomware attack. So, so three pillars three and four are where our focus really, really is is, is going. And next slide, Chris. And some of the the uh, the wording that's used in the the government cybersecurity paper, and again, it's very similar to the healthcare one. You know, despite robust protection being in place, um, cyber attacks will still occur and get through. Next one, Chris. Um, and even with robust protection and detection measures in place, you will be impacted and you need to rapidly respond and minimize the impact as far as possible. Even if you're prepared, you still have to be able to recover and you still have to, um, you, you'll see some common wording here, you still have to be able to minimize the disruption. You need to be able to manage cyber events before they become incidents, which is quite an interesting statement. And you need to be able to swiftly contain and rapidly respond that scale to a cyber event. Now, again, in summary, you need to detect quickly and recover quickly. Next slide, please. So if we look at some of the particular challenges around cyber. You know, it's fairly unpredictable. Uh, again, we talked earlier about the about the more traditional failures. You know, they're they're fairly predictable. You you you, you sort of know what's going to happen if you lose your data center, and you can plan around that. But the attack pattern of ransomware or other cyber events is really really random, and it's a bit like trying to prepare for the unknown unknowns, and and try and fold that fold the data protection element into your larger security stack or security process. The blast radius is key. Yeah, knowing um, exactly which parts of your environment the ransomware or, or that the cyber attack has hit and how far it's spread and how quickly it's spreading is really, really key to being able to recover quickly. And again, if we go back to the, the example of you know, 
running a scan after you've taken a backup and then finding out the next day that something was was encrypted by that time your whole environment could be encrypted so it's really about being able to identify quickly that out of my 500 servers and, and, and 120 applications i'm only seeing encryption in three of those servers so i can ring fence those servers i can continue operations with the rest of my environment just shut down those servers and fix the problem there rather than having to as quite often happens now at the first sign of a ransomware attack people pull the plug out and shut everything down then it becomes really difficult to understand where the problem is unclean recovery points so how do you know that your recovery point is clean that the backup you took last night is good enough it's really really difficult so having having the ability to to check quickly in the background and know that the recovery point you want to use in the event of a problem will be clean and ready to use is really important really important and data loss and downtime again from your in your environment how how do you minimize that and what is an acceptable recovery point in recovery time and a question i always go back to is it within the organization the 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 slas between it and the business were they set based on um what the business really needs or were they set based on what it could deliver at the time and the answer to those two questions may be completely different so it's it's good to review those those SLAs on a regular basis and try and make sure that the that IT is keeping up with the business challenges and business requirements, especially in the face of, of new threats from ransomware. Next slide, Chris. And again, back to backups. If you look at ransomware, one of the things we've seen is that 94% of ransomware attacks now actively try to compromise backups. And we've seen this in a number of places. 57% of those that were attacked, they were successful in compromising backups. So think about what that means. That means you as an organization, you have a ransomware attack. You then think that's fine. I won't pay the ransom. I'll recover from my backups. Then you go to your backups and find out that the ransomware attack has gone in. It's scanned the network. It's found out where the backups are and it's either deleted the backups or it's compromised the backup system so that you can't recover them. A big, big challenge. Now, Having immutable copies of backups helps that, but not everyone has immutable copies of backups and it's not a guarantee. And organizations are two times more likely to pay the ransom when backups were compromised. And they were, the recovery costs were 8x when the backups are compromised. So again, it's a very, very, having an alternative or a, a complementary way of recovering outside of your standard backups is very, very important. Next slide, Chris. So because of that, what's happening is that um, something called a cyber vault so are being increasingly mandated by the regulators and legislators uh, as the best option to protect against cyber attacks. And it's really um, having a, a way of protecting your data against what happens if the backups are compromised. So how do you have that copy of data that if, if, if ransomware gets in and scans the network, it can't see it? So it's air gapped and away away from the main the main infrastructure, uh, and and again you know the, the I guess the purest form of that is backing up the tape and stop taking those tapes off and storing them in a physical vault somewhere. The challenge with that is that when you come to recover, that's an awful long process to get those tapes out of that locked vault and bring them back and then restore from them, which is why it's an untenable solution. And you always need an emergency option of last resort in case all else fails as part of an in-depth defense system. And I think at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Chris to talk in a bit more detail about the cyber resilience vault with Zerto. Over to you, Chris. Perfect, amazing, Tony. Hoping, hopefully everyone can hear me fine. Um, and thank you for spending your time with us this morning. Um, thank you, Tony. Great overview um, to start with. So yeah, I'm here just to talk. You know, what does cyber resilience with with Zerto look like? Run you through um, some some kind of scenarios and some a bit of architecture as well. Um, but yeah, if you do have any questions for myself or Tony, make sure you pop them into the uh, the Q and A box. I know Nikki's already put something in there already, but yeah, please feel free. You know, the more questions the better. We can really tailor the 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 session towards you guys who who are listening as well. If you have any um, questions. Um, so what does cyber resilience look like with Zerto? So essentially, we have three pillars of cyber resilience at Zerto. <clears throat> the first one being replicate and detect. The second one being isolate and lock. And the third one being test and recover. So having all three of these in place gives you a great 
footprint gate great standing to be able to recover data in a timely manner. So Tony's already spoken about replication detection um, in a bit, but we're going to cover in a little bit more detail. What does that look like from a Zerto standpoint? What does isolate lock mean in terms of the Zerto way of doing it? There's a lot of um, different ways of um, uh, marking data as immutable, some more uh, effective than others, and some of them maybe not as, not as effective. And then the third one being test and recover, and we'll show you how do we test, how do we recover, and some of the stats behind that as well. So the first one being replicate and detect. So I know Tony's already kind of discussed this and kind of giving you that overview about, you know, the, the sky plus box and rewind and, and forward, which I think is a great analogy. It really, really simplifies it for, for people like me who, who work in very simple ways. Um, but this is a graphical view of what, what our journal looks like on the screen in front of you. So you can see here, typically, if we're taking backups, we're doing them once a day. Maybe we're doing an incremental snapshot from our most critical systems or something like that but you know maybe 24 hours or six to eight hours of data loss or four hours worth of data loss is typical what we're going to see across across industry with zerto we have the ability as, as as tony mentioned to go back seconds before something has occurred and because we have those checkpoints and we're streaming that data in real near real time that's how we're able to put those checkpoints in the journal every 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds, etc., all the way back to 30 days, as we've mentioned before. And the way that we're doing that is using CDP or continuous data protection. And I know Tony did mention this earlier, but the way we do the detection is also unique in the marketplace also, because we've essentially embedded detection inside of the replication itself. So as we replicate the data from site A to site B or wherever we're going, even locally, we're actually detecting at the point that we receive the data inside of our systems. So the data actually hasn't even been written down to disk yet, whilst we are starting to analyze if any encryption is occurring on that individual block. So we essentially set a baseline of what that VM looks like and go, this is what normal looks like for that VM. And then we look for anomalous detection across those VMs that are being replicated, very simply at a block by block level. What is encrypted before? Yes, no, maybe. And then essentially what we do is we flag and try to give you the earliest possible response to something happening. And that's what we're here to do is stick the flag up and say, we think something is happening in your environment right now. Not 24 hours ago when the backup was taken, not a day ago when the user logged the help desk ticket, you know, not six hours ago when something wasn't quite working when an update happened or whatever. It's we think something is happening in almost real time get your security team to come and investigate right now or take that VM off the network or whatever your action is, do that action for that particular workload. Gives you that response in, you know, super quick response and then hopefully gives you less data to recover overall because we've caught the problem before it's spread across the network. And then inside of our, of our, of our Zerto journal, we then tag the checkpoints to say, we think this looks suspicious. This doesn't look like something that we recognize or what the normal behavior is. So here's a suspicious anomaly. And then we also go back and then tag a clean checkpoint for you. So you can go into the journal and say, okay, my suspicious one here is 953.45, maybe 953 dead on or 953.03 or whatever it may have been. That's the one we're going to use as our clean checkpoint. And we'll tag a clean checkpoint further back and back and back. So you can choose known clean points in time to then recover to if you wish to. So now we move on to isolate and lock. Um, so we do have two ways of, of, of isolating and locking data away. So the first one I'm going to cover is using um, our, our technology called extended journal copy. A bit convoluted, I know, and it's a bit of a Zerto term. So I will explain what that means. So. Inside of Zerta, we have the journal, which we've explained just a moment ago. We have all the copies of all the data for the last two hours, all the way up to 30 days, as we've mentioned previously. So what we do is essentially we take a copy from the journal, extend that out into public cloud or on-premises S3 infrastructure, like Scalacy or Cloudian, for instance, and then lock it away and mark it as mutable inside of the software. So that's why we get an extended journal copy. So we keep, we're taking data from our journal and putting it somewhere else in a third party site and locking it away, mark it as immutable. All of that is controlled inside of Zerto. So it's not something you have to go and set in AWS or Azure or, or you know, take the data outside and manually do it. It's all controlled and, and managed and monitored inside of the Zerto solution. The key point around this piece is we're never taking data from production VMs. 
So we're not impacting production workloads, just like continuous data protection has no impact on those workloads, neither does doing an extended journal copy and marking to the mutable. So you can take these once a day, twice a day using the API if you really want to. However many times you want to take those immutable copies, you can do that. And then we have the concept of ultimate protection using the Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault. So if you are in a highly regulated industry or you have highly sensitive data, which I'd imagine most of the people on the call are going to have very sensitive information, data that is, you know, mission critical to, to government or healthcare or whatever in wherever, you know, public sector organization you're in. This is the type of solution where we're seeing in the marketplace shift towards. So a fully isolated, a fully air gapped, a fully immutable data vault built on zero trust principles. So I will go into this in a little bit more detail um, in a few more slides, but essentially your data is at the center of this. It's always marked as a mutable, not something you turn on or off whenever you place data into the cyber resilience vault. It is automatically marked as a mutable. It is fully isolated and fully air gapped away from production. And again, I'll explain what that means in a little more detail with the architecture slide. It becomes a little bit easier to explain. And we're based on zero trust decentralized architecture. Essentially, no um, single component inside of the vault has control over anything else. So even if something managed to get compromised, which is highly unlikely, it won't be able to take control over anything else inside of the vault. And again, you'll see that. This has been purpose built for cyber resilience only. This isn't a, a you know a DR solution that's been tweaked and tagged on. The cyber resilience vault is purpose built for cyber for cyber resilience only. Right? Again, it's not a backup product that's had some tweaks, changes to it. This is this is custom built, purpose built for cyber, the the sole reason of cyber resilience. And then if we go into test and recover, as Tony mentioned, that non disruptive testing. Um, you know, we can have as much many copies of the data marked as immutable in the world. You know, we can we, we can have the best laid plans, but if they're not tested, they pretty much become useless. Um, we don't know what our RPO would be. We don't know what our RTO would be. We don't know who needs to be involved. We, we don't know what process we're going to be following. So we need to make sure we can test frequently and test extensively. How can we do that if testing for this customer on the screen here takes three and a half days? Every time they want to do a test of any kind, it took them three and a half days to get their test up and running and completed. I've been in IT ops for a, for a long time before before these roles that I've been in now. And I, I used to hate DR testing. It was, you know, always on weekends or bank holidays when you've got that little bit of extra time when the business isn't running at, at full capacity. But it's pain. You know, you're sat in data centers, the pizza's there and everything else happens. But come Sunday night, Monday morning, whatever it might be, Things get wrapped up because the business needs to start work. And guess what? Maybe the test wasn't 100% complete. It wasn't done as extensively as needed be. But guess what? We tried our best. But we haven't got great verification if it even worked properly because it takes too long, too many people involved, and it's hard to do on a regular basis. So we can't track any change, trends or, or changes. And this customer actually purchased Zerto. And after Zerto, their testing went down to less than two hours per, per DR test. So now they can test as many times as they like during day and night without any impact to their production workloads and do that extensive testing. So because we have no impact to production, that enables frequent and comprehensive testing during working hours, not the weekends or bank holidays or Christmas or whatever else your time that you may think is appropriate. They're fully orchestrated and fully automated, which means we don't need 12, 20, 30, 50 people to come and do DR testing. Four clicks of a button, and we can have whole applications, even whole sites failed over for do, to do DR testing in a matter of minutes. Those run books are therefore reduced, so we don't have all that complicated 15, 16, 20, 50 pages of, of complicated click this button, then next, then next, etc. All that is built into the software for you. So that frees up those staff to focus on other strategic things you might want to do, right? No, no one loves doing DR and loves doing backup. It's a necessary thing we have to have. But if we can free up those IT resources to focus on, hey, let's let's focus on stopping cyber attack. Let's focus on AI or whatever else the new, the new buzzword's going to be this, next week, right? We, we, can, we can focus on whatever we want in our organizations rather than doing keeping the lights on and making sure this stuff gets done. And then with all of that combined, Zerto customers perform 18,000 plus tests per month worldwide with an average RTO of just over three minutes. That's pretty impressive when you consider the, the comprehensiveness of these environments, the amount of VMs that we protect, 
they're some of the most critical workloads in the world we're protecting. You know, we're talking critical national infrastructure, you know, some of the biggest companies in the world protecting their most critical virtual machines and three minutes of RTO. So let's dive into the Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault in a little more detail. So why did we do a cyber resilience form. Why did Zerto come to market? Why did we spend time and dev resources and everything else doing it? Because frankly, what's on the market right now for cyber resilience isn't cutting the mustard, right? We hear it from customers day in, day out. I do a lot of thought leadership. I do a lot of partner and customer and everything else sessions all around the world. And I hear the same thing. It's too slow. It takes too long. It's too complicated, right? Those things happen on a regular basis. And, you know, if we go back three, five years, this is what we had. We had backup to recover from cyber from cyber attacks, and that's what we had to use. Now we're starting a new era, and hopefully we can improve that. So I'm going to try and run you through roughly what it looks like using a backup cyber vault or cyber cyber vault based backup product in the marketplace, and kind of look at where where the slowdowns are and where where the inefficiencies are and, and how long it may take. So this is a, a based on a an example customer using 300 terabytes of front end data. So I'm not talking about a company who's got petabytes and petabytes of data here. This is a relatively smallish 300 terabyte customer. So day one, we're starting our backup software recovery. So, okay, we've got to recover our software. We've got to bring it up. We've got to perform a full data scan on a full backup data set before we can even start. So by day three, day four, maybe day five, we're actually starting our recovery. So we're doing data recovery at day five. And what we see from industry and what we see from real life customers that are using these types of products in the marketplace is that the 300 terabytes could take up to two to three weeks to actually uh, recover back onto infrastructure, mainly because they're stored in backup format, right? So they're compressed, they're dehydrated. So we need to rehydrate those backups, convert the formats back. And then we've, we, we're probably using slower disks because they're, you know, they're backup based infrastructure. So we're trying to store things as cheap as possible on slow disk, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So it just takes time for all that, all that to happen. So it could be up to potentially three weeks before we've even allowed our security team to have a copy of the data to be able to start scanning, start our forensics, see what's happened, potentially start um, sanitization as well. And then once we've sanitized the data, so let's say it's three weeks, maybe even four weeks in some in some cases, we could then have to then recover that back to production infrastructure because we can't run from backup infrastructure, right? It's not it's not big enough, it's not quick enough, it's not it's not good enough to run production. And then the only way to do that is because this is a brand new data set that's changed and it's been sanitized. We have to complete that backup again and then complete the restore again back into production. So we're looking at another potential up to seven days before that data is actually available back in, into production, sanitized and cleaned. This causes a huge amount of problems, right? Because we're up to three weeks before we've even allowed security access to the data. You know, that's three weeks of being down before we've even started the recovery process, right? This is just getting data to be cleansed and cleaned and, and looked at before we can even start thinking about getting it back into production. So this is this this is real life data. This is real life from customers we've we've learned from, um, and hopefully it's not your guys' experience. But if it is, like, let me know in the chat. That'd be great. Um, so what does what does a Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault look like? So let's run you through some architecture. So we have production on our left hand side. So we have a vCenter, some hosts, data stores, and what Tony said earlier, any storage. We don't mind what you're using. We'd obviously love you to be using HP storage, but if you're not, it's not a problem for us. And then we have the Zerto components. We, I won't go into detail about what they do, but we have the Zerto virtual manager and the Zerto re uh, virtual replication appliance on there. So that, just think of that as the Zerto software is, is installed. And then we build out a landing zone. So typically this is gonna be co-located next to production. So in the same data center as your production workloads. So you can see in here we have the same infrastructure, so vCenters, Zerto Virtual Manager, Virtual Replication Appliances, so Zerto software. But you can also see we have HP ProLine for compute and HP Electra MP for our storage. You'll be you'll see why we need this in the in in, in coming, but that, that comes as part of the vault. So essentially we're replicating data from production 
into our landing zone using Zerto. We're landing onto the data stores, which eventually lands on the HP Electra arrays. Obviously, as we're doing this data, it is encrypted continuous replication using CDP. And of course, the real-time encryption detection alerting is happening as well. And then we have our vault zone. So in the vault zone, we have HP Aruba for our networking within the vault. We have HP ProLiant for our compute and HP Electra MP for our storage. So we've had data now landed on the landing zone. So the only connection to get data into our vault is via an RCIP connection between two storage arrays. So the vault is physically disconnected from any external networks apart from a directly connected cables between the two storage arrays. So no one can, you know, intercept that network. It's not going over the internet. It's not going replicating over a WAN or anything else like that. It is side by side, cable, array, array. That's the only way you're getting data in. And the, the data is actually pulled from the vault. So it's not a push and it's not on a schedule. It's actually pulled from, initiated from the vault zone to the landing zone and pulled the data inwards. So even if someone managed to compromise the landing zone, it doesn't impact the, the, the replication of getting data inside of the, the vault zone. So once we've landed data inside the vault onto the, the HP storage, we then use virtual lock. So we make immutable snapshots in compliance mode, which means essentially no one ever can delete that data. Even if you run HP support and said, oh, I'm really sorry, I've marked this as immutable. Um, could you could you could you unmark it? Nope, I'm sorry. It is locked away forever and forever and a day until that time ticks out, right? Um, but not only have we um, replicated your data across, we've replicated all the components you need for recovery as well. So we've replicated the Zerto software, all of the journals that that, that Tony and, and I've been, been talking about as well, and including any other things that you've stored on that LHP Electra array. So things like security scanning software, antivirus software, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can all be loaded into the vault zone ahead of time for when we need it for recovery. So the HP Electra provides the storage. Um, and one difference here is what we mentioned earlier is this is running NVMe all flash. So this isn't spinning disk. This isn't slow backup base. This is production grade storage. We have the resilience automation server. So inside of there, this, this is the guy is a completely offline box essentially, but it, it handles all the automation tasks that are happening inside the vault. So, you know, the periodic replication, it open and closes the ports on the arrays to make sure when the replication doesn't need to happen, the ports are off. So there's less attack surface. Um, it, it handles all the um, immutable snapshots and, and making them immutable, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that runs inside of there as well. And then combined the landing zone and the vault zone together gives us the Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault. I will wait just for a couple of seconds, see if anyone has any questions around that. But essentially, that is fully air-gapped away from production, with the only connection being between um, the landing zone and the vault zone being that RCIP connection between storage arrays. So when it comes to recovery, how do we do it? Well, if we want to test, well, if production goes down, I'm ever saying, I mean, on this slide, it works really well, recover left, right? So if we can recover in production by using local copies of the data we have, local journal copies, let's recover directly back into production. Absolutely great. If production isn't available, well, guess what? We've got a copy of the data in the landing zone as well. So if the landing zone hasn't been impacted by ransomware, then we can recover in the landing zone by selecting our apps and VMs to recover, select a known clean checkpoint from the journal that we, that we saw earlier, and then non-disruptively test in a sandbox to validate the clean restore and then recover all those workloads in a few minutes if needs be. And they can run directly on the landing zone because we provided you with compute inside of the landing zone to run those workloads from. But if the landing zone gets impacted as well, which in the worst case scenarios, everything is likely to be impacted, right? I'm not going to stand here and say Zerto won't be impacted. There's a potential that every OS, every piece of technology, everything that's on the network can be impacted by ransomware. I think that's an expectation that everyone should have, that it could be absolutely anything on the network can be, can be compromised. So if our landing zone is no longer available, okay, well, now we've got the vault zone. So how do we recover inside of the vault? So essentially, we mount VMFS from mutable snapshots. And one thing I've, I think I forgot to mention a minute ago, when we're storing data 
on the Electra MP, we are not storing it in backup format. We are storing it in the native VMFS, VMDK format that we need for a quick recovery. So we haven't got to do any conversion. We haven't got to do any rehydration. It is there ready to go whenever we need it. So essentially all we do is mount the VMFS to the compute because we always keep every component disconnected until we need it. So the compute is sorry, yeah, the compute isn't connected to the storage um, until we need it to be. The network isn't connected to anything until we need it to be. So everything is decentralized, as I mentioned earlier. So everything is offline, or sorry, not offline, disconnected in a state where it limits any, any impact that it can have. So we essentially bring on our infrastructure, so vCenter, ISXi, Zerto components. And because we're recovering our data protection solution, we have all of that orchestration, automation, real-time encryption detection, all of those journal points in time that we spoke about, all of those are recovered inside of the vault. So even though we're doing a periodic replication every four hours or so, we've still got all of that granularity in the Zerto journal to go back to as well. So then we recover from Zerto using our clean checkpoint. Exactly what Tony mentioned earlier, those multi-VM applications, guess what? They're all from a single point of time as still. All of that run book that we spoke about earlier, that's still inside of the Zerto software, ready for you to run. So your VMs are going to come up on the right storage, on the right compute, with the right networking and the right IPs, all in the right order as well. So all of that run book is pre-built into the software, is still loaded inside of the Vault Zone as well. So what does the Cyber Resilience Vault give us? I think it boils down to kind of three things. It's fast and secure. It is fully air-gapped. It is fully immutable. The data on there is um, held on high performance or flash hardware. So we're not there to just be another backup repository. We're there to be performant and provide you a clean room as well. So I'm going to go back one slide because I forgot to mention. So this, this compute on the right hand side in HP ProLiant, that provides us with a clean room to actually mount data to in known clean environments or known clean compute and perform security scans, even run minimum viable business from there if we needed to as well. So we not only do we get a data vault, so we have the Electra MP as our immutable data vault, we also get an isolated recovery environment as well, or a clean room as they're more commonly known. So we are one of the only um, cyber resilience vendors on the marketplace that combine those two together in a single cohesive unit. Typically what you'll see is vendors say, yeah, we have an immutable data vault or a, or a, a cloud vault or whatever it may be, but the, always the question is, where are you recovering to? Where are you going to put that data where you know it's clean? Quite often, you're going to have to cleanse your production environments before you can restore that data back. And in that case, you may be down for even longer whilst you, whilst you cleanse that data or cleanse infrastructure. So fast and secure, a full stack solution combining the isolated recovery environment with a secure data vault using that zero trust and decentralized architecture that I spoke about a moment ago. And we have chosen security over convenience. Um, the only way you can administer the Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault is if you're physically stood in front of it inside of your data center. I'm sure there's going to be people who are groaning and saying, oh, God, I've got to drive to the data center. Yeah, it's a pain, right? I've done it loads of times. You get the 2 a.m. call, got to drive and change a disk, whatever it might be. It, it is, it's awkward. But guess what? If you can access the vault from your PC at your desk at your home, any threat actor can access it from their desk at their home. Most other solutions on the, uh, on, out there have a firewall that stops that connection. But it, again, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I would expect in the worst ransomware attacks for everything to be impacted. I wouldn't, imp I wouldn't suggest that my corporate firewalls protecting all of my users have been impacted, but this one firewall that I happen to have protecting my last resort of clean data doesn't. I would always expect for everything to be compromised. So we need to make sure we have that full isolation if possible. And we can achieve all of this at a lower TCO than most other vendors in the marketplace as well. So let's look at the return on investment. So if we're losing a, a leading based, a le sorry, a leading backup based cyber vault in the marketplace, the average data loss is going to be two plus date, two plus days. The availability date of data, 22 plus days, as we mentioned on that slide earlier. So the total ransomware impact anywhere between three and five weeks, which falls roughly in line with what Tony mentioned earlier. The average time to recovery is, you know, one month, right? And they're using backup based systems, not journal based recovery. Now let's look at Zerto, the Zerto Cyber Resilience Farm. So our data loss is going to be four hours or less. 
the availability of data, we can get that back up and running to your security teams within two hours. Because we are using that super quick data, we don't have to rehydrate. It's on all flash storage. We simply mount to compute. We're ready to go. That's all we need. So it's two hours to get that data back up and running for you. So our total ransomware impact is likely to be six hours or less. That is a 99% reduction in that time and that impact. And we are the only journal-based solution for cyber recovery in the marketplace. And I want to cover just some, some built-in advantages that, that I haven't covered and Tony hasn't covered that, that comes with just the software in general, right? You don't have to buy the vault to get any of this stuff. Um, so continuous data protection means we're never missing a backup, right? We're never going to have a problem where we miss the backup window or it doesn't run successfully, whatever else like that. If we miss one, we wait five seconds and guess what? There's going to be another copy in the journal five or 10 seconds later. So not a massive issue. We have a full analytics suite which helps you in that visibility into what you need to see. We can see trends, reports, data usage, alerts, monitoring, all that kind of stuff from our, from our SAS um, control plane. Security hard and Linux appliances. So we've moved recently in the last couple of years to everything in the Zerto suite now is on security hard and Linux appliances. Again, reducing that attack vector and making every customer as secure as possible out of the box not worrying on whether that customer has hardened their, their, their windows or not. It, it makes it a lot easier for us to say, here's the security hardened. It's pre-hardened for you. Please install. Away you go. We have open APIs and deep interoperability with other security stacks. We don't want to be, and I don't think we can be, no, I don't think anybody can be, the, the silver bullet for cyber resilience, right? There's going to be a suite of products that help you achieve full cyber resilience from XDR to antivirus to seam and SOAR, et cetera, et cetera. We want to be able to integrate with that. So everything that we do, we've built on an open API. So if you want to send the alerts for encryption detection, for instance, to your seam and your SOAR systems, absolutely send those away. Notify your seam and SOAR systems that Deserto has think something wrong and let you do whatever you want to do from there. You know, put it into Splunk, trend it, whatever you want to do with it, the data is available for you to do that. We don't have any agents through our solution at all. So that means there's less attack set, uh, surface, but also it doesn't give the attackers any hints as to how we're protecting data, right? There's nothing inside of your VMs to say, oh, we're using a VM agent or anything else in the marketplace, right? There's no, there's no way that, because if they know that, typically they will attack that um, either via a vulnerability or they'll now have the known advantage of, okay, I know what your backup's using. I'll use some known ways to get around that or I'll stop the agent from running, which means I'll stop the backup from completing, et cetera. Everything is always encrypted between the components in Zerto. We have a one-to-many offering also. So included in, in, in the license fee, we don't only replicate from A to B. We can replicate from A up to three different locations at the same time. And that doesn't have to be um, a VMware to VMware site or a Hyper-V to Hyper-V or an Azure to Azure. We can go cross-platform and cross-hypervisor no problem at all. So giving you that kind of defense in depth and kind of that diversifying your data portfolio, if you, if you know, if we have an attack that hits ESXi, but we're replicating up into Azure as well, it's going to take a very, very sophisticated attack to coordinate attacking Azure and your Azure um, tenancy at the same time with the different technicalities, hopefully the different, uh, the, the different security domains and different credentials, et cetera. So, you know, I'm not saying it's bulletproof, but, you know, hopefully it helps. And make sure we're taking those offsite immutable copies. Again, we can take them from the journal and mark them as immutable so they're untouchable right around somewhere. So just a quick, you know, finish up on exec summary. Ransomware is the biggest threat to data integrity today, full stop. I don't, I don't think there is an, a, a, a bigger threat out there right now. Um, and as Tony mentioned earlier, regulators, governments, even if you're not in a regulated industry, I know we're talking public sector and Tony mentioned earlier, there is no mandated we should be looking at these these frameworks like Dora and NIST and use them as the lighthouse, right? Use them as the beacon of what we should be aiming for. Even though we're not mandated, it doesn't, you know, don't have to be mandated to have good hygiene and good cyber hygiene, right? If, if we can achieve the best we possibly can without being mandated, what a great position to be in. Traditional data protection approaches are failing us, you know? That's why ransomware is still still so prevalent because if people were recovering from their backups super quick with less impact and the, the, the ransomware gangs aren't getting paid, guess what? It just stops. You know, the ransomware doesn't happen much anymore because they're not making any money out of it. Um, 
So Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault provides immutability, rapid air gap recovery using that zero trust principles, and we can achieve a lower TCO and we can reduce the impact of ransomware versus the competition as well. So hopefully this has been a helpful session for everybody. Um, I think we've got maybe five or 10 minutes for some questions if there are any. Um, feel free to ask anything, you know, anything you may think is relevant or challenge anything that me and Tony have said, um, you know, hopefully open discussion if there is, if there is any questions. Um, but I thank you for your time um, and, you know, we'll follow up in the future um, with you guys as well. So, so thank you very much for your time and yeah, open the floor to any questions if there is some. Yeah, so thank you, Tony and Chris. Maybe uh, just a couple of questions that come in, but keep on adding them if you've got anything else. Um, one question here about what are some common factors? It, I, you don't necessarily need to mention organisations' names, but any sort of success stories or best practices that you can share from within the public sector on cyber resilience initiatives and, and things that people have you know, taken action on? Um, unfortunately, I mean, sorry, Tony, you go ahead. You go. I, I, I can share one. It's it's quite yeah, it's quite course. an old one, but it's an interesting one because it comes from about seven years ago when I think the first the first wave of, of cybercrime was the WannaCry attack on uh, affected a lot of healthcare organisations. Um, so we um, we were being Zerta was being used by Southport and Ormskirk NHS Trust at the time, and the uh, the head of IT there was a guy called Matt Connor. Now, he's now um, CIO for Liverpool University Hospital and Liverpool Women's. Um, I saw him on a, on a, um, a, a LinkedIn uh, webinar about two or three months ago, and he mentioned WannaCry as being one of the biggest challenges that he had in his IT career. So I messaged him afterwards and said, just one of the check. I know you were at Southport and Ormskirk at the time. Were you using Zerto? And his reply back to me was, yes, we were. It saved us. So that's quite a um, quite an endorsement, I think, from uh, from you know from uh, admittedly an early stage um, cyber ransomware, but but the the principle remains the same. It's about that having that guarantee that you can recover quickly um, and to a point in time that's um, only a few seconds ago. Yeah, great story, Tony. I think that's really really really, really relevant. Um, typically, what you'll find, especially now, I think people were a lot more open previously to kind of talk about you know, good stories in cyber. Um, now I'm finding people a little bit more um, wary about going public because they don't want to get kind of egg on their face. Be like, yeah, look at this great news story we had. And then you know, two weeks later, they get attacked again and it's not a great news story. <laughs> um, but, but you know, but but typically we are getting better at it. Um, you know, education is a big part of it and having the right technology in the place and the right process in place is ultimately what's going to save organizations. Um, yeah. Just one other question has come in at the moment, which really, I suppose, with regards to public sector organisations, obviously range in size dramatically. Um, if we've got very limited resources, you know, what are the kind of initial steps that you might suggest we, we look at? Yeah. Go on, Tony, you take this one again. I'll, I'll, I'll fill in afterwards and hopefully agree with the, everything um, you said. I, I think the first the first thing I would ask uh, ask myself or my organization is if we got hit by ransomware today, um, how would we recover and how long would it take us? And when did we last test it? And I think the answer to those three questions then starts to shape the uh, the things you just should start to do because uh, if if you're you know if the answer to that question doesn't meet your 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 SLAs, and I think quite often you might ask those questions of different people and get different answers. So, you know, the, uh, uh, the the senior leaders in the organization might have an assumption that if we get hit by ransomware, IT will deal with that. They've got that covered. If you then go and ask the IT people, the IT people may say, well, actually, we've been underinvested for the last three years. We, um, you know, it would take us four weeks to recover if we had a serious issue. So I think it's, it's, it's I think the first thing to do is to coordinate the the understanding of the capability across the organization. And then from there, you can start to, to build in and, you know, whether... Whether the first thing to do is to to improve the frequency of backups, if that's you know a fairly low cost thing to do, or whether you then want to start to look at how do you where are your where are your critical applications? If I've got a hundred applications, I, I haven't got the budget to protect a hundred applications fully, but if I can identify the the twenty percent of my applications that are really mission critical to uh, if I had a major problem there, the applications I need to get up really quickly. So an EPR system within within healthcare. Or um, you know maybe finance systems, whatever it is, 
focus the effort on those systems first and then rely on on more traditional backup to um to recover the rest over time i think that was a perfect answer tony yeah i i, I wholly agree i think looking inwards is, is a great place to start um because you need to know where you're starting from there's no point in implementing something you know that's that's further up the stack or further um further on than where you are you know assess where you are in your in your cyber maturity and then you can start looking at the 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 building blocks to get you to where you need to be right you know we all understand that public sector money isn't endless and we all we all pay into that so we want it, we want it to spend it in the right places um, but yeah looking inwards first and understanding what it is um and i think tony mentioned it earlier like th i think the one of the biggest things is just get get some some form of immutability is is key um it won't it won't stop it completely you know we've heard of attacks that have happened where um <laughs> it was either using a backup product and they had it time locked and they just went and attacked the the uh the backup software system and moved the time forward 10 years and just then as after 10 years guess what the data's deleted and guess what they can then encrypt the data and there's no backups to be, <laughs> to be done so it's, it's not foolproof but it's definitely going to help Thanks. I don't think we've got any other questions at the moment. So we're just about um, at the end of our time. So thank you, everybody. I think we will wrap it up here. Thanks very much, everyone. Appreciate your time.